So this is part eight, and this is the FDA draft guidances. And these guidances are not actually statutes or laws. They're non-binding in their regulatory uh, capacity, <clears throat> but they just guide whatever whatever the guide the guidance is saying is just guides the industry along as to what they can do, how to submit applications and things of that nature. So the first one I'm going to speak to is, and I'm on each one, because a lot of them, like this one goes for 37 pages, so I'm not going to read 37 pages, but I'll go through basically the titles of each section and speak a little bit to each one, or else I'd be here for about four hours on just this part eight itself. So the first one is, <clears throat> excuse me, is called Guidance for Industry, or it states FDA deems certain tobacco products subject to FDA authority, sales and distribution restrictions, and health warning requirements for packages and advertisements. <clears throat> Guidance for Industry, Small Entity Compliance Guide. Now this is mainly for small businesses. Okay. This is the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Food and Drug Administration Center for Tobacco Products, May 2016. And there's a table of contents, but I don't have to get through all of that. I'm not even... Well, I'll go into a little bit of this. Introduction. This small entity compliance guide is intended to help small, business, small businesses to understand and comply with FDA's final rule deeming tobacco products. Okay, on that. The agency prepared this small entity compliance guide in accordance with Section 212 of the Small Business Regulatory Enforcement Fairness Act, Public Law 104-121. FDA's guidance documents, including this guidance, do not establish legally enforceable responsibilities. Instead, Guidance documents describe the agency's current thinking on a topic and should be viewed only as recommendations unless specific re regulatory or statutory requirements are cited. The use of the word should in agency guidance documents means that something is suggested or recommended but not required. And they actually speak about current thinking like I don't know, several times, more than several times, probably like over a hundred times in the FDA final rule. And anytime they say current thinking, that means either they're referring to a guidance, a draft guidance that actually is in place now or sometime in the future. Now, the one caption is description of the rule and background. I'm not really getting into that because I spoke to that in regards to the Tobacco Control Act of 2009 in Part in Part 7. I will, I will speak to this a little. Well, I think I will speak to this. Description of the rule background, but I won't get into it too much. But I want to get into some of the definitions in here. Distributor means any person who furthers the distribution of a tobacco product, whether dis domestic or imported, at any point from the original place of manufacture to the person who sells or distributes the product to individuals for personal consumption. Manufacturer means any person, including any repacker or and or relabeler, who manufactures, fabricates, assembles, processes, or labels a finished tobacco product. Point of sale means any location at which a consumer can purchase or otherwise obtain tobacco products for personal consumption. So that could be a face-to-face -face in a vape shop, or that could be online, or anywhere there's an actual monetary transaction. <clears throat> Re 
required warning statement means a, t a textual warning statement required to be on packaging and in advertisements. Retailer means any person who sells tobacco products to individuals for a personal consumption or who operates a facility or vending machines or self-service displays are permitted under this part. Automatic provisions of the Tobacco Control Act and FDA's tobacco regulations upon the effective date of the deeming rule, that is 90 days from the date of publication, and that was uh, May 10th, 2016, was the publication date in the Federal Register, and the effective date is August 8th, 2016. The newly deemed products will be subject to Food and Drug and Cosmetic Act provisions and FDA regulations that apply to tobacco, tobacco products, such as those covering one alterated or misbranded tobacco products, two, required submission of ingredient listing and reporting of harmful and potentially harmful constituents, or HPHCs, three, required registration of tobacco product manufacturing establishments and product listing, four, prohibit prohibition against sale and distribution of modified risk tobacco products unless FDA issues an order authorizing their marketing, Five, prohibition on the distribution of free samples. And six, pre-market authorizations orders for new tobacco products. And as far as like three, the registration, vape shops have to list every single thing in their vape shop. From drip tips to e-liquids to variable water devices to um, RDAs to two mech mods to fully mechanical box mods, to batteries, to uh, you name it. Whatever they're selling, they have to actually list that as a product listing. And then they also have to, um, like it says, require registration of tobacco product manufacturing establishments. So they actually have to uh, say um, um, how many employees they have. They have to ha tell them how much they approximately make every year. They have to tell them if they have a license to practice in the state. That they have to um, they have to afford that to the or they have to give that submit that to the FDA. Um, any kind of revenue, um, or that's the same thing. Any type of costs, um, all, all that information that to conduct yourself as an actual business slash small business has to be submitted to the FDA just a registration I, I I believe there's a fee attached to that but it's not very much you know maybe a thousand maybe two thousand dollars something don't hold me to those exact figures though and then in, there's another part restrictions on the sale and distribution of tobacco products to minors to comply with the age and identification verification requirements retailers are required to verify a purchaser is at least 18 years of age by reviewing the purchaser's photographic identification. However, retailers are not required to verify the age of any person who is more than 26 years of age. So that's discretionary, but they gotta be very careful and make sure that person's 26 years or older. Because if they have one of the investigators from the FDA go to a vape shop, and let's say that person appears to be, you know, that person's really 22 years old, but the vape shop employee slash owner, and the owner would be responsible for the employee's um, conduct or actions. If in fact that person that sells whatever product it may be, let's say you sell this e-liquid bottle, this e-liquid to a customer, and you think, well, that guy probably looks like he's 35 years old. And so you sell to that customer to only find out that it's actually an investigator from the FDA and he's really only 22 years old or she's really only 22 years old. They will cite you with a serious violation of $15,000 to start with. As I talked about in the, um, in the port um, 
six FDA electronic submissions. Then is the required warning label statement on packages. This required warning statement must appear on all cigarette tobacco, roll your own tobacco, cover tobacco product packaged labels. It is unlawful for any person to manufacture, pack package, sell, offer to sell, distribute, or import for sale or distribution within the United States these products without the required warning label statement on the tobacco product package. And there's a whole way to do it. You have to have like at least 30% of the um, panels have to have certain labeling on it. It has to be conspicuous. It has to be prominent. You can only use at least 12-point font size. It has to be um, in Arial Bold Type or H-E-L-V-E-T-I-C-A or similar sans serif fonts. It has to be in black text on a white background or white text on a black background. It has to be capitalized and um, punctuated. All this, is, all this stuff has to appear on the um on the on the packages so like this thing here this like like perfect example see all this i mean i mean i need a magnifying glass to read this but there's actually lettering right here i don't know if you can see that but there's lettering right here that has to be at least 12 point font size so they're going to have to make that all that whatever it's saying right there has to be bolder than that and not only that it has to appear either black text on white background or white text on black background it can't be white on this blue that's how they have it and then it goes into other things as far as uh, containers and wrappers and everything else also it, it can't be too small of a print Required warning statement on advertisements, on print advertisements and other advertisements with a visual component. The required warning statement must appear on the upper portion of the advertisement within the trim area. Occupy at least 20% of the area of the advertisement. And it goes on and on and on. I actually speak to some of that in the FDA final rule when I get to that part. Self-certification and alternative Required warning statement. The nicotine addictiveness warning statement on packages and advertisements is not required for tobacco products that do not contain nicotine if the tobacco product manufacturer has submitted to FDA a confirmation statement certifying to be true and accurate that, that the product does not contain nicotine. That is, no nicotine at detectable levels and that the tobacco product manufacturer has data to support that assertion. And that's what I talked about in the, uh, that other part, that you still have to submit a certification, a self-certification to the FDA that says that there is no nicotine in a zero mig nicotine. So you still actually have to process that through the FDA, but it's a, a bit more easier to go through. It's not as a difficult process as a PMTA or the SE process. Uh, retailer warning statement exceptions contains a health warning is, is supplied to the retailer by the tobacco product manufacturer, importer, or distributor. Um, A lot of this stuff I'm going to speak to in the FDA final rule, so I don't really need to go into it too much here. Um, but this is regarding how does the deeming rule define a component or part? How is that different from an accessory? And then it goes, the following is a non-exhaustive list of examples of components and parts used with electronic nicotine delivery systems or ENDS, including e-cigarettes, which includes e-liquids, atomizers, batteries with or without variable voltage, cautomizers, 
atomizer plus replaceable fluid filled cartridge, dis digital display, lights to adjust settings, clearomizers, tank systems, flavors, and programmable software. So that's pretty much it. I mean, most of this stuff I, I will speak to in the um, in the FDA final rule part, which is part um, part nine, I believe. Yeah, part nine. A little bit on this here, the compliance periods for submission and FDA receipt of applications for newly deemed tobacco products under the three pre-market pathways are as follows. Substantial equivalence exemption request 12 months from the effective date of the deeming rule. Substantial equivalence reports 18 months from the effective date of the deeming rule. Pre-market tobacco applications 24 months from the effective date of the deeming rule. Of course, that's August 8th, 2016 is the effective date. So anyway, I'm going to pretty much, pretty much, uh, okay, uh, I'll read this too as well. The additional time to comply afforded to the small-scale tobacco product manufacturer includes substantial equivalence extension request for the first 30 months following the effective date of the deeming rule, FDA presently intends to grant extensions on a case-by-case -case basis for substantial equivalence applicants that need additional time to respond to substantial equivalence deficiency letters, tobacco health document submission, FDA presently intends not to bring enforcement action against small-scale tobacco product manufacturers who submit the required information Within 12 months of the effective date of the deeming rule, ingredient listing submission, FDA presently intends not to bring enforcement action against those small-scale tobacco product manufacturers who submit the information required in 904A1 of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act within 12 months of the effective date of the deeming rule. So anyway, that's that's pretty much it. And then it talks about age and identification restrictions. But I get into all of that in the FDA final rule. Health warning requirements. Anyway, that's it for that one. The next one is good guidance practices. It's another guidance, uh, draft guidance from the FDA. It reads, Food and Drug Administration Report on Good Guidance Practices, Improving Efficiency and Transparency. This is all in the FDA final rule. Everything that I speak to in the FDA draft guidances all is all cited in the FDA final rule. So, Food and Drug Administration Report on Good Guidance Practices, Improving Efficiency and Transparency, completed September 30th, 2011, issued December 2011. Once again, I'll just go through this. It's 20 pages long. I'll just sort of skim through it. Summary of current guidance initiation practices Current stakeholder input prior to guidance development, FDA's good guidance uh, procedures, uh, excuse me, good guidance practices regulation specifically provides that stakeholders can suggest guidance topics and or submit drafts of proposed guidance. Stakeholders often informally identify issues that would benefit from guidance at advisory committee meetings, industry meetings, roundtables, and listening sessions. Stakeholders also submit citizen petitions to identify policy issues that the agency may decide to address by issuing guidance. Because of resource constraints, however, FDA is not always able to issue guidance in response to, sta to stakeholder suggestions or to issue guidance as expeditiously as it would like.
and it talks about current decision making process processes for initiating guidance talks about recommendations prioritizing work planning tracking guidance summary of center office prior prioritizing work planning tracking processes recommendations developing guidance summary of guidance development processes establishing working groups developing concepts and drafting the guidance recommendations Reviewing and clearing guidance, summary of the review and clearance processes, recommendations, issuing guidance and outreach, making stakeholders aware of draft and final guidances, and that's pretty much it for that. So that's mainly for, for stakeholders that I spoke about in part two FDA contracts. And they have a lot to say when it comes to how these guidances or these practices or these procedures are done with the FDA. Next thing I'm gonna to speak to is the tobacco product master files. Open up here. Okay, this is called Tobacco Product Master Files, Guidance for Industry. United States Department of Health and Human Services, Food and Drug Administration, Center for Tobacco Products, May 2016. It's five pages long. This guidance provides, introduction, this guidance provides recommendations to industry on tobacco product master files, T, TPMFs, or used to permit the person that owns the TPMF, TPMF owner to authorize other persons to rely on information in the TPMF to support a submission to FDA without the TPMF owner having to disclose that information to other persons. And I actually speak about this in the FDA final rule. Plus, I also spoke about this in the, I believe it was in the, um, Part 6, FDA Electronic Submissions. A discussion how to establish a master file, what to submit. For purposes of this guidance, a TPMF is a voluntary submission to the FDA that contains information about a tobacco product, including but not limited to materials, parts, components, and accessories of to tobacco products, whether facilities, processes, or articles used in the manufacturing, processing, packaging, and storing of tobacco products that the manufacturer does not want to share with other persons. And then it goes through the whole, whole list of everything. How other persons can use a TPMF. The TPMF owner may, in writing, grant authorization to reference the TPMF to other persons, including applicants and manufacturers. The written author authorization should describe the specific sections of the TPMF to which the TPMF owner is authorizing right of reference. And what this means is, it's like say you have, you submit a cuboid. The initial, let's say the very early submissions, and they actually speak about this in the FDA final rule, and I'll speak to that when I, when I do that part, part nine. But the early submissions or the early applications to the FDA will not have anything really in the master in this, um, I don't know what to call it again, the TPMF, the Tobacco Product Master Files. So in the Tobacco mas uh, tobacco Product Master Files, in the very early stages, let's say someone submits some, if they can afford it, that is, they submit through the pre-market tobacco application process. Let's say they submit 
to five hundred and ninety nine thousand dollars not not to the FDA but they have to do their own testing and everything they finally submit their application to the FDA for this cuboid and let me take off the RDA so you can just focus on the, on the so they just submit this for this for for this particular you know I don't even take the batteries out so it's really the real deal so this thing you get you get this uh, Joytech this is a, um, a Joytech product so let's say Joytech imports this into America and in order to import it into market this product in America or the United States they have to submit a PMTA application and let's, let's say they submit it sometime in after August 8th, 2016. Let's say they do it in I don't know, October 2016. Well, there's no other applications or any kind of files that are currently at the FDA that look similar to this. There's no other products like that. All right. So let's say another person in January of 2017 I'll take out the battery on this one second okay so let's say someone in January 2017 submits this is by Schmock. Also, they would import it in order to market this product in the United States, unless the Cole Bishop Amendment goes through, of course, because this was manufactured, because that's what matters. It's not so much if it makes it to the market. It's the manufacturer date when it's actually made as a finished product. Then it's considered, if because this was made in, I think, early early 2016 now this was made in 2015 anything on the market before 2000 uh, anything on the market before August 8th 2016 the cold bishop amendment goes through they don't have to worry about going through this PMTA process but let's say hypothetically that doesn't go through so somebody in January 2017 Joytech submits this particular product application to the FDA well what they can do is they can say in the tobacco product master file you're already approved of this product because it has to be approved of course it can't just be sitting there waiting to be approved once it's approved it goes into the tobacco product master file approved by the FDA and so let's say in January 2017 Schmock submits for the Kapoor 60 watt mini, or or maybe a 60 watt mini, or maybe for the Kapoor 200 plus, or whatever have you, 200 watt plus. Now this, even though it, the sizes are a little different, it still operates the same way. That is, you know, it has a, a screen, has power button, has your to get into your menu system, to adjust your wattage, to adjust your uh, your voltage, the same thing with this. Power button, I mean the design's a little different, but the functions, the function of the device is the same. And then on the Joytech cuboid, 200 watt upgraded to that, or really 150 watt, is you have these two things that adjust for the menu. This is for the menu. Does uh, you know wattage, voltage, and everything else? Of course, this is a little bit more complex than this one. I mean, you could do uh, TC or on, on here. I mean, it's, it's it, this cuboid is a little bit more complex than the Kapoor. Okay, but still, it's essentially the same. And so, all they have to say in January of two thousand seventeen is that they say, well, the cuboid application was approved. 
and that's in the master file. So all they have to say is, well, you know, the Kapoor Mini 60 watt is pretty much similar to the cuboid. And so therefore, they don't have to go through so much red tape and, and, and go through so much investigative uh, research on this particular um, variable wattage device. They still have to go through some testing and things of that nature, but they don't have to go through it too much because this is already in the master file. And all they have to do is refer to it. In a sense, it's sort of like the substantial equivalence process, and that is these two devices are similar in nature. And so considering this operates very much like this, Schmock, in January of 2017, hypothetically, of course, okay, um, can say, well, the cuboid's been approved, and because this Kapoor Mini 60 watt is similar to this, therefore I don't have to go through so much, that is, the manufacturer doesn't have to go through so much paperwork because they could just refer the Kapoor Mini 60 watt to the master file. You understand? So, and the more products that are approved by the FDA, the more products that come thereafter will be easier as well just by referring to the ma master file, just like an RDA. An RDA is usually just an RDA. The deck might be a little different. Like this is a velocity deck. The deck is much different. The posts are different as opposed to some other RDA, like a two post. Some of them are postless, but it's basically the same thing. The metals are basically all the same. Now, some of these RDAs do have a metal post or even all the posts or some of the posts that are made out of copper. So they would have to do different analysis, scientific analysis on that. But once that's submitted and approved by the FDA, then that kind of RDA can be referred to in the master file and cut down on the paperwork as well as the cost. So that's what that's all about as far as tobacco product master files. So it helps um, with the uh, expediency of the process. It moves it a little quicker. Okay, so that's, that's that. Now we'll get into next one is and I'm only referring to the ones that are directly out of the FDA final rule. I'm not referring to the ones that the FDA will bring about someday in the future. And there are many other draft guidances. Uh, I mean, it's so many of them from the past. But the only ones I'm speaking, I'm only going to speak to eight of them. Because only eight of these are actually in the FDA final rule. I'm only speaking in context of the FDA final rule. So anyway, uh, this one is called Guidance for Industry and Investigators. It says, Guidance for Industry, Investigator Responsibilities, Protecting the Rights, Safety, and Welfare of Study Subjects. United States Department of Health and Human Services, Food and Drug Administration, Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, Center for Devices and Radiological Health, Procedural, October 2009. This is 18 pages long, so I'm, not, I'm just going to go through it. This is basically, let's speak to the introduction. This guidance provides an overview of the responsibilities of a person who conducts a clinical investigation of a drug, biological product, or medical device. Now, of course, this also has to do, believe it or not, with vaping products. Go figure that one out. This is actually out of the, or they actually cite this in the FDA final rule. The goal of this guidance is to help investigators better meet their responsibilities with respect to protecting human subjects and ensuring the integrity of the data from clinical investigations. This guidance is intended to clarify for investigators and sponsors FDA's expectations concerning the investigator's responsibility, one, to supervise a clinical study in which some study tests 
are delegated to employees or colleagues of the investigator or other third parties, and two, to protect the rights, safety, and welfare of study subjects. And actually, I speak to that in part two, uh, FDA contracts. The overview of investigator responsibilities is ensuring that a clinical investigation is conducted according to the signed investigator statement for clinical investigations. For clinical investigations for the investigational plan and applicable regulations. Protecting the rights, safety, and welfare of subjects under the investigator's care. Uh, clarification of certain investigative responsibilities, supervision of the conduct of a clinical investigation, what is appropriate delegation of study-related tasks, what is adequate training, what is adequate supervision of the conduct of an ongoing clinical trial, What are an investigator's responsibilities for oversight of other parties involved in the conduct of a clinical trial? Study staff not in the direct employer of the investigator, parties other than stu study staff, special considerations, protecting the rights, so safety, and welfare of study subjects, protocol violations that present unreasonable risks, and it goes on and on. Anyway, the point is, is that what this is about is when someone submits an application to the FDA, the FDA takes that application and submits it to either research labs or institutions, organizations, associations who analyze all the material, who investigates or is the investigators on whatever particular application they're working on, which I speak about in depth in part two FDA contracts. So that's all that's about. It's just the investigator's responsibilities on whatever clinical trials are working on, clinical studies, clinical trials on vaping products. Next thing is um, applications for uh, pre-market review of new tobacco products. Guidance for industry, applications for pre-market review of new tobacco products, draft guidance. U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Food and Drug Administration, Center for Tobacco Products, September 2011. It's 26 pages long. Just speak about it a little bit. One second. My ear is a little clogged. This is not crazy. Um, anyway. Okay. Discussion. Who submits a PMTA? Person seeking a marketing authorization order under Section 910C1AI must submit a PMT to FDA. The, the term new tobacco product is defined in section 910A1 of the FDNC Act and includes any regulated tobacco products, including their components, parts, or accessories, whether sold for further manufacturing or for consumer use. When should you submit a PMTA? You must submit a PMTA and obtain marketing authorization order under Section 910C1AI of the FDNC Act prior to the introduction or delivery for introduction of a new tobacco product into interstate commerce. And that is anything after August 8, 2016 must have this authorization. And unless the Cole Bishop Amendment goes through, in three years' time, on May 11, 2016, any of the products that are on the market before August 8, 2016 that does not get approved by the FDA must be either taken off the shelves, taken out of the marketplace, or the FDA 
considering they have an enabling powers, that is, they not only um, can uh, write statute, they can affect law, but they can also enforce it. And they will literally come and seize your products, penalize you civilly, as well as maybe even criminally prosecute you. And they actually say that in the FDA final will, and I'll speak to that when I get to that. How should, you, how should you submit a PMTA? FDA recommend, recommends that an application for pre-market review of a new product, new tobacco product includes the following. A cover letter, including the name and address of your company, an authorized contacts name, title, address, phone number, email address, and fax number. The name of your new tobacco product, any previous regulatory history, that is any uh, prior Section 905J decision, dates of any prior meetings with FDA about your tobacco product, and any request for a review of your application by the Tobacco Product Scientific Advisory Committee, and an executive summary including an overview of your application, a description of your tobacco product, a summary of non-clinical and clinical studies and major findings and why you believe allowing marketing of your new tobacco product is appropriate for the protection of the public health. As set forth in Section 910B1 of the FDNC Act and discussed in greater detail in Section 5 of this guidance, your application must include, let me make this a little bigger, this is very important stuff here, what they're talking about must include full reports of all investigation of health risks, including studies submitted to your support your showing that the tobacco product is appropriate for the protection of the public health, a full statement of all components, ingredients, additives, properties, and of the principle or principles of operation of such tobacco product, a full description of methods of manufacturing and processing, which includes a listing of all manufacturing, packaging, control sites for the product, including the facility name, address, telephone number, and a contact name for each, for each facility, including the contacts, telephone number, and email address, an explanation of how your product complies with any com applicable tobacco product standards, samples of the product and its components, and specimens, a proposed la labeling. How will we review a PMTA? FDA will review your PMTA consistent with the requirements of Section 910C of the FDNC Act. Under this section, FDA is required to review a PMTA as promptly as possible, but in no event in no event later than 180 days after the receipt of an application, Section 910C1A. After initial receipt of your application, FDA may request additional information about your PMTA as necessary. Full reports of investigations of health risks. This is a little long here, but I got to read this because it's very important. Section 910B1A of the FDNC Act requires that a PMTA contain full reports of all information published or known to, or which should reasonably be known to, the applicant concerning investigations which have been made to show the health risks of such tobacco product and whether such tobacco product presents less risk than other tobacco products. FDA interprets the information requiring under this, super, under this provision to include not only investigations that support the application, but also any investigations that do not support or are or, or adverse to the application. Information on both non-clinical and clinical investigations should be provided, including but not limited to any studies assessing constituents of tobacco or tobacco smoke, toxicology, consumer exposure, consumer use profiles. Further information on investigations concerning products with novel components, ingredients, additives, or design features that are similar or related to those of the new tobacco product 
and investigations concerning products that share novel components, ingredients, additives, or design features with the new tobacco product should also be provided so that the FDA may adequately assess the health risks of the product. To the extent the information is available, you should indicate the source of funding for all studies provided. FDA interprets full reports of all information published or known to or which should reasonably be known to the applicant to include all information from investigations conducted both within and outside the United States. While all clinical investigations both within and outside the United States submitted to support your application should be conducted to ensure that the rights, safety, and welfare of human subjects have been protected. You must submit full reports of all information concerning relevant clinical investigations, even if the study did not protect the rights, safety, and welfare of human subjects. For published studies concerning investigations which have been made to show the health risks of your tobacco product, you should provide a biblo Bibliography, I don't know, I know I mispronounced that, B-I-B-L-I-O-G-R-A-P-H-Y of the studies and an abstract for each study. You should also provide an explanation of the scope of the literature review you conducted to discover the relevant published studies, including how you identified, collected, and reviewed the studies. The data and information you submit in your PMTA must be sufficient to show that the marketing of your new tobacco product is appropriate for the pu protection of the public health. Your application should include a summary of the results of each study you submit to support your showing. The summary should include, where available or reasonably obtainable, a full description of the study objective, a description of the study design or hypothesis tested, a description of any statistical analysis plan, including how data were collected and analyzed, and a brief description of the findings and conclusions, positive, negative, or inconclusive. In addition, for each study showing the health risks of your product, you should include to the extent available or reasonably obtainable documentation of all actions taken to ensure the reliability of the study and the protection of human subjects. For example, a documentation of study oversight by an investigational review board duly constituted and operating under 2-1 Code of Federal Register Report 5-6. Documentation of informed consent procedures such as appropriate procedures found in 2.1 CFR Part 50 and documentation of appropriate good laboratory practices such as those found in 2.1 CFR Part 58. The original study protocols and any amendments. If, if investigator instructions were produced in addition to the protocol, copies of all such instructions. The statistical analysis plan, including a detailed description of the statistical analysis used, including all variables, confounders, and subgroup analysts. The reason for your choice of sample size, including calculations of the power of each study and the level of significance and or confidence interval used, and any amendments. All raw, all raw data to facilitate our review, we request data in SAS transport file format created by a procedure that allows the files to be relatively read by the GMP software. We also request that you provide data definition files that include the names of the variables, codes, and formats used in each data set and copies of SAS programs and any necessary macro, 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 excuse me, macro programs used to create derived data sets and the results reported in the study sub in the study reports all versions of questionnaires used all versions of case report forms used all informed consent forms and a full report of their findings full statement of all components ingredients additives and properties and, and of the principal principles of operation of the new tobacco product I got to read this. It's very important with this PMTA process. And if you listen to all this, if you get this far in this video, 
you'll see that this is the reason why that PMTA process is just so crazy that no one will be able to um, go through this unless you're an extremely big company like maybe Inikin or Schmock or Joytech that have millions and millions and millions of dollars to go through this. So I'm going to continue. I have to, I have to go through this. This is very important. Properties. Section 910B1B of the FDNC Act requires you to submit as part of your PMTA a full statement of the properties of the tobacco product. FDA interprets a full statement of the properties of the new tobacco product to mean a full narrative description of the tobacco product, including a description of the form of the product, a description of the product dimensions and the overall construction of the product, using a diagram or schematic drawing that clearly depicts the finished product and its components with dimensions, operating parameters, and materials, a description of all design features of the product, that is, location of ventilation holes, heat source, nicotine concentration, gradient. The description should specify nominal values of the explicit range of values as well as the design tolerance where appropriate. A description of tobacco blending, reconstitution, or manipulation. That is mainly an analog. A quantitative description of the performance criteria, that is, burn rate, ventilation criteria, dissolution rate, that's also an analog. A, a description of how the product differs from similar currently marketed tobacco products. Summaries of the results of tests performed on the lots, lots or lots, represented by the submitted samples, and established shelf life of the product. We should include data establishing the stability of the product through the stated shelf life. Principles of Operation, Section 910B1B of the FDNC Act requires you to submit as part of your PMTA a full statement of the principle or principles of op operation of the tobacco product. FDA interprets a full statement of the, of the principle or principles of operation to mean a full narrative description of the way in which a consumer will use the new tobacco product, including a description of how a consumer operates the product, that is, where the consumer places the tobacco product in the mouth or nose, whether the consumer ignites the tobacco product, and by what means, whether the, pro the product is designed to be smoked, inhaled, swallowed, is dissolved, sniffed, or chewed, how long it takes for a consumer to consume a single unit of the product, and whether the product uses a heating source, and if so, a description of the heat source, that is, burning coal or other substance, electric or butane, chemical reaction, carbon tip. Full description of methods of manufacturing and processing is acquired in Section 910B1C of the FDNC Act. You must provide a full description of the methods used in and the facilities and controls used for the manufacture, processing, and where relevant packing and installation of the new tobacco product. You should provide a listing of all manufacturing, packaging, and control sites for the product, including the facility name and address and contact name and a telephone number for each facility. Moreover, you should provide a narrative description completed by a list and summary of all standard operating procedures and examples of relevant forms and records for the following categories of information. Manufacturer, ma manufacturing and production activities, including a description of facilities and all product production steps. Managerial oversight and employee training. Manufacturing processes and controls for product design and changes in products, including a hazard analysis that details the correlation of the product design and attributes with public health risk, as well as any mitigations implemented. Activity, activities related to identifying and monitoring suppliers and the products supplied, including, for example, purchase controls and product acceptance activities. Validation and verification activities used to ensure that the tobacco product matches specifications. Testing procedures carried out before the product is released to market. 
and handling of complaints, non-conforming products and processes, and, co and corrective and preventive actions. Samples and components you must provide with your PMT A. Samples of your new tobacco product and of components of your new tobacco product as FDA may reasonably require. FDA may conduct its own testing and analysis of your new product, new tobacco product and its components. Consequently, your PMTA should include a sufficient number of samples for FDA to conduct any testing and analyses. Proposed labeling as required in Section 910B1F of the FDNC Act. The PMTA must include specimens of all proposed labeling for your new tobacco product. Labeling is defined in Section 201M of the FDNC Act as all labels and other written, printed, or graphic material, one, upon any article or any of its containers or wrappers, or two, accompanying, accompanying such article. It includes labels, inserts, onsets, instructions, and other accompanying information or materials. 21 United States Code 321M. Information to support is showing that the new tobacco product is appropriate for the protection of the public health of public health. With respect to the risks and benefits to the population as a whole, including users and non-users of the tobacco product and taken into account the increased or decreased likelihood that existing users of tobacco products will stop using such products, and the increased or decreased likelihood that those who do not use tobacco products will start using such products. General principles for scientific studies under Section 910C4 of the FDNC Act, your new tobacco product will be evaluated to determine whether the product is appropriate for the protection of the public health considering the risks and benefits, including the health risks of the product and the likelihood of changes in initiation and cessation rates. These considerations will allow for an evaluation of the impact of the new tobacco product on morbidity and mortality for the population as a whole. And it goes on and on. Product chemistry. Product chemistry, while not determinative of issues related to the public health impact of your new tobacco product, is relevant to our evaluation of the health risks and addictiveness of your product and provides context for evaluating other non-clinical and clinical data submitted in support of your PMTA. FDA recommends reporting HPHC, harmful and potentially harmful constituents information in the tabular format, format using separate columns in the order listed below from left to right for each of the following. The constituent name, the constituent's common name or names, the corresponding chemical abstract services number, the unit of measure, the level measured for the submitted product with 95% confidence intervals, the sample size, and the method of measuring and reference quotes. Non-clinical studies. Non-clinical studies provide important probative information regarding the health risks and addictiveness of tobacco products. While non-clinical studies alone generally are not sufficient to support a, de a determination the product is appropriate for the protection of the public health, the information from these studies provides insight into the mechanisms of disease incidents caused by tobacco product, by a tobacco product, and more generally provides context for the data regarding health risks and addictiveness obtained from human studies. Your non-clinical investigation should evaluate the toxicity, toxicity abuse liability, and carcinogenicity of your new product new tobacco products as compared to other tobacco products on the market. For example, if you choose an Ames Muta, that's M-U-T-A-G-E-N-I-C-I-T-Y assay, A-S-S-A-Y, as part of an evaluation of the car 
synogenicity, which is basically a cartagen or um, you know cancer, and it's spelled as C A R C I N O G E N I C I T Y of your tobacco product. You should explain why the A S S A Y is appropriate for evaluating your tobacco product, how the AIMS assay has been used historically, what scientific evidence there is that the assay is useful in evalu in evalu in evaluating carcinogenicity and mutagenicity, the choice of strain of test bacteria, the choice of method of product administration, and what scientific evidence there is that the assay is sensitive enough to demonstrate a dose-response relationship and distinguish between tobacco products. Studies in adult human subjects. The primary goal of investigations in adult human subjects is to evaluate the health risks of a new tobacco product by assessing the effects of the new tobacco product on human health and behavior. That is pattern of use and tobacco use topography. Uh, I know I mispronounced that. T-O-P-O-G-R-A-P-H-Y. Toxicant exposure and biological effect abuse potential and consumer perception perception. These studies will provide FDA with important information to enable it to determine whether the product is appropriate for the protection of the public health. Your studies in adult human subjects should provide the following evaluations of your tobacco product. Tobacco user exposure to tobacco-related compounds, tobacco user health risk and disease incidents, tobacco product use patterns, that is smoking, tobacco T-O-P-O-G-R-A-P-H-Y, frequency of use and or use by different age groups, including evaluation of consumers' use of the new tobacco product concurrently with other products already on the market, abuse, liability, and addictiveness, consumer perceptions, including risk perceptions based on the product itself, as well as the packaging and labeling of the new pro tobacco product, and cessation rates for users of the new tobacco product. And then it has investigational use of new tobacco products. Instead, we recommend that the summary of your proposed study protocols include the following information. Study objective or objectives, study hypothesis, background information, a brief description of the new tobacco product and any regulatory history, study design, study population, number of subjects to be enrolled, inclusion, exclusion, criteria, comparison group or groups, human subject protection information, including IRB information, primary and secondary endpoints, definition success criteria, statistical analysis plan, description of the statistical methods to be employed, the reason for your choice of sample size, including calculations of the power of each study and the level of significance and our confidence level to be used, data collection procedures and duration of follow-up and baseline and follow-up assessments. For all studies, both clinical and non-clinical, you should limit direct distribution of the product to qualified and appropriately trained investigators, not promote or test market an investigational tobacco product for commercial distribution, account through receipt, use, and disposition of all investigational product or products, and label the product for investigational use only. As studies conducted outside of the United States, confidentiality, and end of that. And that is just the PMA, the PMTA process, the pre-market tobacco application process. Do you really think a, a, a small e-liquid manufacturer could possibly go through that? Absolutely not. He will literally go out of business, period. And that's why that Cole Bishop Amendment is very important. Because any products, including e-liquid, that's on the market before August 8th, 2016, will remain on the market without having to go through all this crap in the PMTA process. That's absolutely insane. That's over-regulation. Especially considering the FDA does not have any substantial scientific data that states that e-liquid is harmful to uh, the public health. So I'm going to speak to uh, three other ones here. (sighs) 
and this is registration and product listing guidance for industry registration product listing for owners and operators of domestic tobacco product establishments United States Department of Health and Human Services Food and Drug Administration Center for Tobacco Products April 2014 Guidance for Industry, Registration and Product Listing for Owners and Operators of Domestic Tobacco Product Establishments. I actually have to take a vape here. I'm sorry. <laughs> the FDA makes me want to vape. Knuckleheads. Vape on my cuboid. Cole Bishop Amendment goes through. I get to vape on my cuboid or buy, I can buy anything that's on the market before August 8th, 2016. Just give me a moment here. In fact, you can vape as well. Take a break. Vape a little bit. And then I'll continue. Tell you, the FDA really makes you want to vape, I tell you that. Here's to you, FDA. <laughs> they really make you want to vape, I tell you. Anyway. The di the, uh, this introduction, this guidance document is intended to assist persons making tobacco product establishment registration and product listing submissions to FDA. The guidance document explains, among other things, the statutory requirement to submit tobacco product establishment registration and product listing submissions definitions who is responsible for, for providing Registration and product listing submissions, what information is included in the submissions, how to submit the information, when to submit the information, FDA's compliance policies. We have background, discussion, what definitions apply. We talk about commercial distribution, domestic establishment, establishment, labeling, manufacturing, owner, operator, pouch, tobacco product who registers and submits product listing information under Section 905 of the Act. What information is submitted as part of registration and product listing under Section 905 of the Act? Registration, product listing information. I pretty much spoke about this in the PMTA, though. Um, it's not as extensive as it is in this, but it's still basically the same. How do you submit registration product listing information? What, When must you register and list under Section 905 of the Act? Excuse me, and that's pretty much it. I just want to read one little area in here regarding product listing information. Section 905I3 of the Act requires the following changes to the product list to be reported twice a year. For any tobacco products you have introduced for commercial distribution and have not included in a previous product listing, the complete product listing information as described above. For any tobacco products you have discontinued manufacturing for commercial distribution since the last report, notice of such discontinuance containing the name of the product is previously listed in the date of discontinuance. For any tobacco products you had given notice as being discontinued and have since resumed manufacturing for commercial distribution. Notice of such resumption containing the date of resumption and complete product listing information as described above. Says we are interpreting Section 905I of the Act to require that each product included in a product listing be clearly identified and distinguished. 
products that differ in any way other than packaging differences that do not affect characteristics of the product or considered to be dis distinct tobacco products. And on and on it states. So it just speaks about how you have to list things as far as your registration and product listing. And this mainly goes for small businesses. And I, that I spoke about that in... Um, in the guidance for industry and, and, and number one, the very first thing that I talked about in this particular part A tier. So that's the end of that one. Next one is substantial equivalence. Guidance, guidance for industry demonstrating the substantial equivalence of a new tobacco product. Responses to frequently asked questions, edition two. U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Food and Drug Administration Center for Tobacco Products. Document issued on September 8th, 2015. This is a revision to the first edition of this guidance, which FDA issued March 4th, 2015. It's 37 pages long, so I'm not going to go through the whole thing. A pre-market application of marketing authorization order under section 910C1AI of the FDNC Act are not required. However, if a manufacturer submits an, and substantial equivalence report to FDA under section 905J21 United States Code 387EJ and obtains an order under section 910A2, Finding that the new tobacco product is, one, substantially equivalent to a tobacco product commercially marketed in the United States as of February 15, 2007, and, two, in compliance with the requirements of the FDNC Act. If a new product, if a new tobacco product has been modified by adding or deleting a tobacco additive or increasing or decreasing the quantity of an existing tobacco additive, the manufacturer may, instead of a pre-market application under Section 910B, submit an exemption request under 21 Code Federal Register 1107.1. FDA may, re may grant the exemption request if it determines that, one, the modification is a minor modification of a tobacco product that can be sold under the FDNC Act, and, uh, and two, not and, but two, a report demonstrating substantial equivalence is not necessary to ensure that permitting the product to be marketed would be appropriate for protection of the public health. And three, an exemption is otherwise appropriate. And they're mainly talking about, and this is the predicate date. And that's why if the Cole Bishop Amendment passes and is enacted in law, into law, signed by the President, all products before August 8, 2016 will remain on the market, including e-liquids. And any products that come after August 8, 2016, that look like this, look like that, look like this, will only have to go through the substantial equivalence process, which is less costly and uh, not as much paperwork. One second. In the Tobacco Control Act, Congress described two sets of ki of ki two sets of criteria for FDA to apply in finding a product substantially equivalent. I, a product has the same characteristics as a predicate tobacco product, or two, I, I, a product has different characteristics and the information submitted contains information that demonstrates that it is not appropriate to regulate the product under the PMTA provisions because the product does not raise different questions of public health. So, like I, the same characteristics as a predicate tobacco product. So if the Cole Bishop Amendment goes through and signs into law, any product that looks like this after August 8, 2016, 
which has the same characteristics, will only have to go through the sub substantial equivalence process. Anyway, that's pretty much what that is. I don't want to, this goes on for a while. And I don't want this particular video going too long. But that's pretty much what it is as far as the substantial equivalence process. the end of that. And I talk about the substantial equivalence process as well in the FDA final rule part 9. And the last one is substantial equivalence manufacturer request for extensions. Guidance for industry substantial equivalence reports manufacturer request for extensions or to change the predicate tobacco or to change the predicate tobacco product draft guidance U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Food and Drug Administration Center for Tobacco Products July 2014 Request for extensions under section 905 J1A of the Federal Food and Dr Federal Food Drug and Cosmetic Act manufacturers that submitted sub SE report or substantial equivalent equivalence report must provide the basis for the determination for the determination that the new tobacco product is substantially equivalent to an eligible predicate tobacco product, just like I explained before about the August 8, 2016 situation. And that's pretty much it. It's not much difference. But they can actually ask for um, one second. Request for extensions. Um, recognizing that pre market review requirements are new to this industry, Center for Tobacco Products issues letters providing manufacturers an opportunity to address the deficiencies within a certain time period. In response to these deficiency letters, many manufacturers have requested an extension of the time period in which to respond, and frequently the time period requested is several months or more. Center for Tobacco Products granted these extension requests for the initial period of the substantial equivalence program to assist manufacturers as they developed experience in preparing pre-market submissions. So they do permit you to correct certain deficiencies in these applications, but they only, only allow it for a period of time. As a result, manufacturers should now have enough information to prepare SE reports and amend pending SE reports to address any deficiencies in their SE reports within the time period specified in the deficiency letter. So if they get a deficiency letter, FDA will say, I don't know, 90 days you have to correct this or six months you have to correct this. It's according to whatever issue issue is at hand. So maybe if, um, I don't know, let's say with this Kapora Mini 60 watt, um, let's say maybe um, they, they did everything, they, they did all the studies they could on this, except that um, maybe in the temperature mode, uh, titanium was off by, I don't know, uh, uh, the heat on titanium was off by, I don't know, five degrees or whatever. So they would, according to that, maybe FDA give them, I don't know, 90 days to correct that particular problem, resubmit it to the FDA 
for approval so they can have the entire product approved. Something like that, you know. That's all this is about. And that's pretty much it as far as the port 8 FDA draft guidances. And um, the next uh, area I will speak to is the um, part 9, which is the FDA final rule. And then after that, I will do the epilogue. Guys, have a good one. Bye.